So good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. I think it's evening for a mayor and uh, morning for BJJ. <clears throat> Let me see if I can get our screen popped up. There we go. Today we're going to talk about, um, we, we focused most of the channel on uh, cardiovascular disease, the number one, number two cause of, heart att of uh, disability and death in the world um <clears throat> that and the number one thing that's fighting for number three number four area for disability um is um not heart attack and stroke but it's also caused by the same thing uh glucose intolerance um the um alzheimer's so <clears throat> But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about something we haven't talked about very much, undiag uh, di undiagnosed lung disease. So <clears throat> lung disease is the number one or number three cause of death of disease-related uh, uh, mortality in the world. And most people think, well, a chronic lunger, that's somebody that's a, a smoker and it has a 30-year pack your history of smoking, and we know all about that. Um, the reality is it's, it's like uh, cardiovascular disease and uh, dementia in that the underlying causes are, can be going on, and the vast majority of us that have the problem don't know it. So let's, uh, let's get a little bit deeper into that today. Previous topics we've covered was uh, depression. Can depression cause heart attack? Can heart attack cause depression? Does diabetes cause both? And the answer was uh, yes, yes, and yes. The uh, other ones like uh, diabetes drug cause decreasing COVID-19 death risk. Why was that important? A lot of people, a couple of people responded to that and said, well, you know, why don't you just get your vaccine or uh, just not worry about COVID-19, depending on their uh uh, their political leanings. And the point behind that was maybe a little bit obtuse. Uh, I tend to do that sometimes. The point was uh, the difference between a, a uh, lethal disease, COVID-19, and a relatively harmless infection from a, from a virus called uh, coronavirus is usually diabetes or diabetes-related diseases, blood sugar in and of itself. There was also an interesting comment where somebody said, you know, it's really more the blood sugar level than it is the uh, presence or absence of a diagnosis of diabetes. That is also true. And that person uh, may or may not have seen our, our video on the subject. Before we get into uh, the topic of the day, just a couple of other points. The reason for the existence of this channel is to help people realize that the real killers and disablers that uh, exist in our world today are things that unfortunately our doctors don't recognize very well and certainly don't treat very well. Things like uh, cardiovascular plaque, cardiovascular inflammation, both being caused by a root cause of insulin resistance prediabetes, over 90% of which is just not diagnosed. And the science is out there. The evidence is really clear. So obviously we can't cover every patient in the world, every patient that has this issue. We've had a lot of people just say, hey, doc, you know when, what? I went ahead and took your, some of your tests and I don't have prediabetes. I've got full-blown diabetes and my doc didn't know. That in and of itself is the reason for existence for this channel. If you haven't had an OGTT, haven't had an insulin survey, you really need to get one. And if you don't understand this stuff, we can help you get set up to where you know probably more than your doc, certainly more than 80 to 90 percent of doctors, primary care doctors, about what's most likely to kill you, what's most likely to disable you for 10 or 20 years. Uh, there are a couple of ways to access it. This is through webinars. This is through courses. The courses are uh, really inexpensive and within within a couple of hours. 
you can, again, know more than the vast majority of docs about what's most likely to kill or disable you. We just had another snafu with the, with the book. I mean, this thing is such a headache. I'm not even going to go there. Not even going to talk about it today. Uh, one thing uh, I do want to talk about is the, the courses. And uh, we're setting up a, a way that you can win the courses for free. All you have to do is listen to a video. Uh, check out the videos. We will uh, go to one of these two uh, uh, links. And then you can start finding videos. Uh, if you listen to the video, you're more likely to uh, score high on the, the quiz. There's a quiz with three to five questions. Um, one in three people wins a, a free course. So again, if you're thinking about getting a course, that's a great way to do it. Now, <clears throat> this is not very much of a COVID channel because of my public health background, because of the impact uh, of epidemiology and what's been going on. I have covered different components. One component I thought was worth covering is this the fact that the Indian variant, the, the variant that's in India that's been fanning the flames of the pandemic there has been classified by the WHO as a variant of concern. Now, why is that news? That in and of itself may not be news, but the facts surrounding it, I think are worth a, at least a couple of quick slides to report a little bit about what's going on. It touches on things like breakthrough infections, people that have had a, a vaccine and um, why are they getting breakthrough infections? Are the vaccines working? Uh, so let's just cover that real quick. The uh, WHO has reclassified a highly contagious triple mutant COVID variant spreading in India as a quote variant of concern. That's sort of like uh, when the uh, the police are after a, a murder, uh, they've discovered a murder victim and they start developing their, um, their suspects. They call them a person of concern. Uh, it has become a global threat. The variant is, has been labeled uh, as of concern if it's been shown to be more contagious, more deadly, or more resistant to current vaccines or treatments. Now, although there's increased transmissibility demonstrated by preliminary studies, it's necessary to perform more research on this lineage and sub lineages targeting the sequencing of that specific uh, genetic variant. Current, current data shows the existing COVID-19 vaccines remain effective at preventing disease and death in people infected with this variant. So the variant is preventing disease and death uh, for the most part. But again, we're gonna get to a little bit of a wrinkle on that in the next slide. <clears throat> the variant has since spread to other countries, including the United States. So if you think that, oh, it's a bad, there's a bad variant, a bad bug in India, and we're safe from it over here in the US, ah, think, think again. Uh, news in the U.S., by the way, uh, the Biden administration just uh, just announced 50 percent of adults in the U.S. are fully vaccinated. That is both vaccines. Some states about I think it was half a dozen of them have over 70 percent uh, vaccination, complete vaccination rates. Now, we still have uh, breakthrough infections. The breakthrough infections tend to be mild. Now, <clears throat> Guess what's causing a lot of the breakthrough infections? The variants. So, yes, the vaccines are working for the variants. They are decreasing significant disease. They're clearly decreasing transmission from someone who gets the disease, gets the infection. Uh, but they're still causing a significant number of the breakthrough infections. So what does that mean? Uh, we've talked multiple times uh, there have been a lot of conversations about, well, there'll have to be boosters in the future for the vaccines to deal with uh, these variants. The reality is that may not be the case. That's actually, uh, there's actually active debate going on on that. And it's really too early to tell. So <clears throat> I'm not going to add any other uh, rounding out comments or summary comments, because as we all know, 
the uh, this bug and its vaccines tends to uh, be trip off a lot of political debate. Now let's get to the um, to the program for today. Undiagnosed lung disease. Could this be you? You know, you say, well, um, I don't have lung disease. Well, most of the people that have lung disease would say exactly that. It is an un another undiagnosed killer. Uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is the number three cause of death in the U.S. 70 to 90 percent of patients suffering from it are still not diagnosed. Progression and death from this number with number three cause of death are, is clearly preventable. It's caused by multiple factors other than just smoking. We, uh, you, you hear COPD, like I said earlier in the intro, and you automatically think a long history of smoking. I used to do a lot of work with toxicology and industry. We had a lot of uh, issues there with COPD uh, from pollution within the industry and occupational hazard. You have countries like China, which have huge issues with pollution, uh, again, also associated with lung disease. And then there's a really big genetic issue here. It's called AAD, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Now, I'm not going to get too deep into AAD, the genetics of COPD, other than to say this, um, this video is the first of several that we'll be doing in a series on uh, chronic lung disease. Now, how do you prevent progression, disability, and death? Well, in many ways, the very same way that you prevent progression of disability and death with cardiovascular inflammation. Watch your diet. Maintain a healthy weight. Education and self-management. Environment. Now, here's where uh, you have a unique twist uh, beyond the lifestyle for just cardiovascular management or cardiovascular prevention. Clearly, number one, smoking cessation is still a big issue. It is the number one issue associated with this disease. Um, and we're going to talk about current smoking versus past smoking in, in a couple of slides. Um, <clears throat> and environmental protection, again, that's, uh, that can be a bigger issue, especially if you're talking about the larger environment. But if you're in an environment, you're living in a home where there's a smoker, that's an issue. So let's talk about uh, prevalence of undiagnosed COPD. This is a study. There's some challenges with the study, and we'll talk about them in just a few minutes. But again, it's, uh, it's some of the early studies done in this space and it helps us understand some of the things that we need to be looking for. It was in a family practice journal, uh, European uh, journal, uh, a few years ago. The aim was to des describe the prevalence and severity of undiagnosed COPD in patients with respiratory infections attending urgent primary care. In other words, if you're uh, having to go to urgent care or receive urgent care from your doc, for pulmonary infections. What does this say about your potential risk? We'll talk about it in just a minute. The goal was to identify variables in the patient's history that could be used to detect previously undetected chronic lung disease. Aging was the biggest issue. Um, now you could say, well, aging and smoking, and we'll get into that maybe get into that debate some, but why is aging a big issue? Well, uh, elasticity is a big issue for, uh, for aging. We lose the elasticity of our connective tissue and there is no place in our body that's more dependent on tissue elasticity than our lungs. Muscle performance is a big issue. As you lose uh, tissue elasticity of the, the lung tissue, the ability to expand against that decreased elasticity becomes a bigger and bigger deal. Inflammation is a huge deal. Um, as we'll be doing, some of the new uh, videos that we're going to be doing in this series show that inflammation is really the long-term problem with chronic lung disease. As we start differentiating between chronic uh, bronchitis and chronic emphysema, 
um, they're both inflammation. With bronchitis, it's inflammation of the the wall of the bronchiole or bronchi, the uh, the air tubes. With um, in, emphysema, it's dealing with the air sac, the place where the exchange of uh, oxygen and for carbon dioxide actually occurs. Both of those require very thin uh, mucous membranes. The um, the lung, the uh, airways, the bronchioles, bronchi, require thin mucous membranes in order to ma maintain a solid lumen, an area where the air flows well. If those mucous membranes lining it swell up you lose the ability to get air in and out. With emphysema, the, the um, air sacs themselves, basically the way the lungs work is that you've got these air sac tissues divided over and uh, over on itself multiple times. The whole issue is to get uh, increased exposure of the alveolar mucous membrane the air sac mucous membrane. Um, so you can have that exchange between the blood. So the blood can get the CO2 off and can absorb oxygen. Emphysema and inflammation of those membranes uh, results in damage. And both of them result in decreased elasticity of the lung tissue. So here's some of the things that we found with, or that were found with the study. Patients 45, uh, 40 to 75 years, uh, 138 of them with acute respiratory tract infection, positive smoking history, and no previously known pulmonary disease. Now, here's one of the issues, positive smoking history. So you're looking at, by definition, already a, a group that has had a smoking history. You're not looking at a combination of the two. So that's going to wash out some of the impact of smoking. We'll talk about it in a minute. Pre and post bronchodilator spirometry. And a spirometry is a test where you, you get hooked up to some tubes and you inhale and exhale as much as you can. One of the key items is how much you can ex exhale in one second. And that's called the FEV1, functional expiratory volume in one second. The reason that's so important is uh, this thing of elasticity and obstruction. If your uh, bronchioles are squeezed off with swollen mucous membranes, you can't get that air through. <laughs> so you're struggling with it. On the other hand, if your uh, alveoli are broken, uh, they tend to collapse on each other and it's hard to get air through that first second. That's why FEV1 is so important. And that's what the spirometry is all about. They also looked at prevalence and severity of COPD, developing an estimate. Uh, several variables were assessed, gender, age, smoking status, current versus previous smoking, and intensity. How many pack years of smoking did they have if they were smokers? A pack year is one pack per day for 365 days. And, you know, you go back to med school where you're seeing – uh, sick populations, it's not unusual at all to find a 10-pack year, 20-pack year, 30-pack year, 40-pack year history of smoking. So the, the type of infection was look, was reviewed, too, to see if that had anything to, uh, to tell us, um, mostly looking at upper respiratory infection versus pneumonia or lower tissue respiratory infection. The two bigger things that that uh, were shown were age and smoking intensity. Those were the big issues. And guess what? That's not a surprise, is it? Now, this is one of the challenges with the study. Uh, age was a big determinant. So why on the graph would it look like a scatter plot? I think that uh, I'm not going to get into the details of why that came out that way. But age is a big deal for COPD. Let's go to a, another, uh, another study. This is predicting risk of undiagnosed COPD, development and validation of a target COPD score. 
Uh, the goal is to develop a score used to identify high-risk patients and provide early treatment and screening. In 2017, researchers from University of Birmingham in uh, England developed a risk score to identify undiagnosed COPD. It builds on primary care records, such as, again, as we said, age, which is huge. It's critical. You can debate whether, you know, age and smoking status. Smoking status is by far the biggest uh, um, risk factor that can be changed. Um, but, you know, it's like heart attack and stroke. Age is still a huge risk factor for heart attack, stroke, and the root causes um, uh, insulin resistance. Now, why did I go there? In both of those conditions, um, age can't be changed. Uh, it, it can be stopped, but you know, obviously we're looking for things that we can change. Smoking status is the big one. Uh, dyspnea, that's basically difficulty breathing. And they, again, what we're doing is we're going, not so much risk factor, uh, it's a risk factor for diagnosing disease. And so what they're doing on this study was looking at things like age, smoking status, was the patient complaining of difficulty breathing to their doctor? That was a big uh, risk factor for a diagnosis of disease. Prescriptions of salbutamol, which is a medication for COPD, obviously, and uh, prescriptions of antibi for antibiotics. The electronic health uh, records and spirometry were used to develop and validate the score. Uh, about 2,398 participants, 40, age 40 to 79 years, no prior diagnosis of CP, COPD answered the questionnaire. So this is a different um, perspective. This, again, these are folks that had uh, no prior diagnosis, but it didn't include only people with smoking. Again, they, they found the same thing that, that we know. Um, age is a major risk factor, not something we're gonna change. Smoking status, the biggest uh, risk factor that we can change. And one of the things they found was uh, current smoking versus history of smoking um, made a big, big difference if you were still smoking. So one of the things to think about is, look, um, we all can heal, no matter how old, no matter how uh, 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 damaged, well, maybe not all of us, but we can heal a lot better than you might think. If you're smoking, and even if you have COPD, you can have an impact on it by stopping. Thank you so much for your interest this morning. We're gonna uh, see if we can have the water ball from, uh, from Gilbert and then go into questions. So you may have noticed our music has changed today. Um, not going to go into some uh, discussions of why, but it has. And I like I like the new music. I hope you do as well. Uh, good morning, BJJ in California. Good morning, uh, Amer in Germany. Well, again, it's not going to be morning in, in Germany as it's going to be evening. Uh, good morning, Bart. And Cape Cal, thank you for this, Dr. Brewer. Thank you for your interest, Cape Cal. Fort Worth Westside. Hi, in my home OGTT, oh, my home OGTT showed 85, 171, 151, and 84. I have some IR, insulin resistance, I'm sure. Yes, you do. Optimum values would be a, a one hour peak of um, 120. Now, one of the questions I would have for you, Fort Worth, is you didn't give me the times. If that 171 was the half hour number or a one hour number, it makes a difference. Um, so uh, Fort Worth goes on to say on keto, less than 25 grams per day, no bad carbs. That's impressive. I hope you can keep that up. Most of my patients that are on these extremely low levels of, of carbs do have some challenges uh, keeping up with it. How would craft results change what I'm doing to keep my blood glucose low? Uh, 
what what craft results do is they give you a really good gauge on what's actually going on. See, here's the question. I had a patient with similar results just a couple of days ago, um, yesterday maybe, and I'm going to make an assumption. Well, here, here's the, the numbers that person had. He came out of the blocks with a blood sugar of 102. So we knew he had a significant down effect. We knew he had insulin resistance just based on that number alone. His one hour number was 163. So the perspective was, yep, you've got some insulin resistance. And then his thir uh, two hour number was what? Something like 150, 140. And so the issue was, yeah, we know you've got insulin resistance. Uh, you're, you, you clearly have suboptimal values. But here's where the uh, Kraft Insulin Survey comes in. Uh, optimal numbers at that point for those numbers for fasting would be five or less. His fasting glucose, basal glucose was 20. One hour would be uh, 50 or less. His fasting, uh, his one hour uh, insulin number was 263. And um, his um, two hour was like still way up in the 200s, two, 210, something like that. So the insulin values are very helpful for us to understand Number one, how bad is your insulin resistance? Number two, how much, um, how much reserve do you have left in your pancreas? Now, his pancreas, as I shared with him, his pancreas is not going to go year after year after year pushing that kind of level of insulin. Even if it does, the science has already shown very clearly hyperinsulinemia, too much insulin in the blood causes heart attack and stroke risk, even if there is no obvious hypoglycemia. So <clears throat> it's very helpful to know what your ins how much insulin is required to keep your blood sugars at the level that they are. Um, you can have other people with those kind of numbers, and yet they have relatively low insulin rates those kind of people are usually in a little bit better shape. They're usually just starting to run into some problems. So, uh, and then you can have people that have a blood sugar going up into the 200s, but their insulin values don't get above 20. That would be what we call stage five, where your pancreas has just worn out. It's been banging against uh, a lot of resistant uh, re insulin receptors, for too long, too many years, and it just cannot produce uh, a lot of insulin like my patient that I described in the first part of this discussion. So Fort Worth, that was a great question. Thank you so much for sharing it. Robert Weiss, good morning from the North Georgia mountains. Good morning to you, Robert. Mezzanine made it. Well, glad to see you're here, Mezzanine. Um, Sophia M., what's the connection between blood sugar levels and lung disease? Thanks, you're great. Um, Sophia, I'm not, I, I certainly didn't say there is one. Uh, what I said was uh, our channel has been focused on lung disease and, I mean, uh, heart attack and stroke and its root causes uh, prediabetes. But you know what? There's a heck of a lot of people dying and becoming clearly disabled from lung disease. So we're spreading out a little bit. We're talking about some other killers and disablers. The top other one that we've not talked about yet is lung disease. Now, if you're, talk if you're talking about a, a connection that you're aware of, please let me know. Um, Jonathan Hull did a, um, a super chat button. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Good morning, Dr. B. What's the recommended dosage of bergamot? Gosh, I don't have that in front of me, and I don't remember dosages on bergamot. Um, they are just... Um, mm, let me see. Uh, let me... 
Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to, to produce that for you. Uh, somebody else uh, help me out here. Let's look that up. No, I don't think I'm going to be able to find it. Somebody help us out. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Gilbert, for showing the uh, how, to, how to do a super chat if somebody else would like to. Uh, the super chats help. You know, they, you, you, say, you look at that and you say, well, you know, we've got we're burning uh, physician time and we're these are expensive and yada, yada, yada. These super chats make a big difference. Um, we have a significant uh, number of folks helping make this uh, channel available, this information available to folks throughout the world. It's not just an American. Uh, we're based here in the U.S., but uh, a little bit less than half of our folks, half of our viewers are in the U.S. now. This is a global channel. Um, Asp Aspen and uh, Gilbert. Gilbert is uh, co-piloting today. Um, and Gilbert's in the Philippines. So uh, the Super Chats make a significant difference uh, in terms of uh, what we uh, what we can offer on the channel. Tired looking for name. Interesting uh, name. I, I got a little bit more information about tired looking for name and how that came up. Uh, he told me that, you know what, every time I'd put a name in, they'd say, mm -mm, nope, that was uh, that name's already taken. So he just got tired looking for name. So thank you so much. Tired looking for name. I appreciate the uh, uh, the interest. So Cape Kel, what can be done to increase lung elasticity and lung health as we age? There is one of the most important things to remember. Um, just ongoing inflammation, for example, smoking and, as we know, uh, cardiovascular inflammation, both tend to, uh, uh, again, be big sources of inflammation and big sources of anything that causes inflammation, whether it's in the cardiovascular system or the lung system itself, can cause this problem. If you start looking at uh, long-term difficulties breathing, you know what the number one preventable cause for that outside of smoking is? It's very much related to the number one preventable cause of cardiovascular inflammation and prediabetes, body fat. You ever hear of Pickwickian syndrome? There was a Mr. Pickwick in the Charles, uh, uh, gosh, somebody help me on the name of that author, uh, Dickens in, uh, in the Dickens stories. And he described a fellow that was so heavy in England at that time period that he was having trouble breathing. Well, you get a lot of Pickwickian syndrome these days with, in the middle of the, um, the obesity epidemic. So by far, the most important thing that you can do for, for, uh, for just ability to, um, uh, to breathe, to, to maintain good uh, ventilation outside of smoking is keeping your weight down. Then once we uh, get beyond that, exercise. Exercise is a huge thing. Uh, if you can, uh, one of the things that's very important that most of my uh, patients haven't, haven't really connected to, they think that jogging is a good thing. And jogging, if you can do it, is a good thing. Aerobics is a good thing. A lot of people are just able to walk. But even folks that are only able to walk really need to focus on a thing called high intensity intervals. We've done several videos on that. And even for somebody who does nothing but just walking in the mall, it's really, excuse me, it's really helpful to go ahead and start pushing into some uh, more intense methods. Now, um, somebody walking in a mall, that's sort of hard to get an intense, uh, an intense session. Uh, some ways to do it would, would be to go up and down stairs, up and down hills, up and down ramps. Um, anything that can increase your need to, 
breathe hard. Now, if you're practicing breathing hard because you're exercising, that helps in terms of your ability long term to maintain ventilation. Sophia M. Sophia from Toronto again. Isn't it true that diabetics are at higher risk of dying of COVID? Absolutely. And I believe I mentioned that in the uh, in the entry, the um, intro to this video, Sophia. There have been several uh, videos that we did covering that. Number one, the risk for having COVID if you get infected from the coronavirus is much, much higher for people that have diabetes. And they actually got a little bit deeper than that. What they found, Sophia, was that uh, in a study in New York, they found that it what really mattered was uh, yes, a, a diagnosis of diabetes was very important, but what, hap- what mattered even more was the blood sugar level when they were admitted to the hospital. So <clears throat> why would that be an issue? Number one, um, there's both a chicken and an egg issue. Number one, you're, um, if you get severely sick, you're going to have um, your uh, cortisol the stress of of severe illness is going to crank up your cortisol, which in turn will crank up your blood sugar. So the question is, well, was it the severe disease that was causing the blood sugar or was it the um, blood sugar, high blood sugar that was causing disease? That study didn't really tease that question out. But one thing it did do was differentiate between just a history of diabetes and hyperglycemia showing that hyperglycemia, having too high blood sugar, was worse than just a history of diabetes. The good side to that, the the good news uh, coming out of that study is this concept. Over half of us have insulin resistance or at least prediabetes. Many of us have diabetes. Again, once we reach age 60, So that also maybe helps connect a dot on why so many older people were at severe risk for COVID-19 with the coronavirus infection. The other point that made is it doesn't matter quite so much whether you have a diagnosed problem. What matters is whether you're controlling it. And that makes a lot of sense. You know, you can control uh, diabetes. I've had a couple of, uh, of blood sugar values over 200. Uh, Anytime you have one over 200, you're classified as a full-blown diabetic by uh, technical classification terms. A lot of my patients, uh, the vast majority of my patients that have had a blood sugar over 200 rarely get a value over 120. How do they do that? Number one, by keeping their body fat down, their weight down. And number two, by uh, controlling their carbs, their carb intake on a daily basis. So the difference between somebody that's full-blown diabetic and dies from COVID-19 versus someone who's fully diabetic and doesn't have a problem with it, this evidence would indicate that the one that didn't have problems with it, even though he was diabetic, was controlling his blood sugar, controlling his problem, managing it through number one item is lifestyle. Now, you would think, well, if that's true, there should be an impact on things like metformin. You know, metformin is the most commonly given frontline drug for diabetes, and a lot of people take it for prediabetes. In fact, if you if you read up on folks like David Sinclair and some others, myself included, uh, there's a study called TAME study, targeting aging with metformin. And it was a study that was developed by the National Institutes of Aging. Um, not just one doctor, Nir Barzilai was a doctor, is the doctor that's the principal investigator, but he's not the only one that came up with this idea. The, the gerontologists at um, the NIA, National Institute of Aging, said, look, we know that uh, diabetes and insulin resistance, what drives diabetes, is the major cause of most of the problems associated with aging 
and other problems like COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> so we also know that we have a, a very safe drug, uh, metformin. Why don't we just put metformin in the water after a certain age? That's what the TAME, the TAME study is, targeting aging with metformin. They said, look, at age 65 and beyond, we're going to just start putting uh, metformin in the water. I'm not familiar with it. It took years to get that study funded for some silly bureaucratic reasons, which I won't go into now unless somebody has an interest. But now let me go back to the beginning of that digression. You remember I said that study in New York indicated that having control of your diabetes was far more important uh, than the risk factor of having a diagnosis of diabetes. And you remember I said, and they, that certainly in, indicated to be true. So you could maintain your health, even if you had a full-blown uh, diabetes, by managing it, maintain that risk, even with something like COVID-19. So now let's go to the metformin issue. So if that concept were true, and it certainly appeared to be true from New York study, then you would expect people that were taking metformin to have less risk for COVID-19. Guess what? They did. We reported on that as well, Sophia. So Sophia, thank you so much for that question. It was very, uh, very interesting, very helpful. Gave me an opportunity to go down, not maybe not one, but two, uh, two bunny holes. Back to Fort Worth. Can LDL be too low? Oh, my goodness. Here we go into that debate. That, it's a great debate. Thank you so much for asking. Would it cause problems with infections or ischemic stroke? stroke? Who decides these numbers? Well, let me start with who decides these numbers. Unfortunately, way too many people are way too passive. Medicine is complicated. So the temptation is to just let your doctor decide all of that. There is major risk in doing that because as I've shown, and we talked about it in the very beginning of this channel or, or the very beginning of this video and each one of our YouTube live videos, the evidence, the science that has been put out to look to see, do most primary care doctors really understand what's killing and disabling their patients? And the answer is hmm, not so well, unfortunately. Um, they don't understand prediabetes very well, not, not how to manage it and uh, not even how to diagnose it. So again, that's the reason for existence for this channel. As I said before, and as I've said today, we get into some other things like lung disease, but let's go back. So who decides the numbers on LDL. There is a major debate on LDL. I think just like with prediabetes, a, a well-informed patient is the best patient and you're best off. I think you need to learn a little bit about the, the issue of LDL, that debate, and make some decisions for yourself. Now, um, so I, I go, I typically go into that with my patients. And then the next response is, well, doc, you do this for a living. What do you do? It's a good question. I will say this. I'm not worried about uh, high LDL levels. There are, there's a, a couple of subpopulations uh, genetically that have very high LDL. It's called familial hypercholesterolemia. You can look it up. There's, an, there's a website called it, the FH website, familial hypercholesterolemia website. And the people that have it are just very much afraid that they have huge increased risks for a heart attack and stroke. And they do, but I've got a lot of people with these FH levels. And here's a tip, here's a tip off to whether you may have that. It's not that common. It's one in 200 families, one in 500 families. It's not really clear. I think it's really closer to the one in 200 families. Given what I do, I've got patients from all over the world that have this. Uh, anytime you have an LDL of 180 or greater, 
you probably have the the, the probability is over uh, 75% that you have one form of FH or another. Now, when I say one form of FH, there are over 2,000 genetic variants right now that have shown an, a, a um, that it will cause FH. Um, most of these people, uh, again, they all, uh, they come to see me, they have FH, they have, they've had blood, uh, LDL levels, 190, 210, those kind of numbers, which most docs look at and just their eyes pop out. These folks still do not tend to have as many problems as you might expect until they hit their fifties and sixties. And what's going on in their fifties and sixties that appears to be pushing them over the edge in terms of risk? Not so much the LDL, but when they're developing insulin resistance. And, and that's what happens over and over again with my patients with FH. We go back, we focus on insulin resistance. Now, that still didn't get to your question. I, I spent a lot of time digressing in a couple of different areas. There are a lot of folks that say, look, you want to have very high levels of LDL. Near, no, not near Barzillai. There's a cardiologist. I'm blanking on his name. He's a, he's a YouTuber. He's putting that out a lot that you want high LDLs, 150 kind of range. I'm not going to argue with him on that. Uh, there's also a bunch of folks that say, no, no, you want to have it down in the 20s. Uh, those folks are the folks that are, have been using um, the PCSK9s. It's a new uh, genetically derived um, LDL drug. Uh, and it was developed for people with, uh, uh, with FH. They start using it on people that don't have FH, but just to decrease LDL. Uh, here's the, the end of the day is, that data that they're quoting to say uh, getting LDL into the 20s doesn't hurt. I've seen some of that data and that's not incredibly strong yet. On the other hand, do I think 150 for LDL is a, is a major risk? Maybe not so much, but here would I'm sort of like a, a Cinderella on that. I want something just right. Um, I go through that information with patients and I say, you know, now you have to make your choice. And then they say, again, what do you do personally? So personally, I'm okay, but anywhere between uh, 110 and uh, 60. I have always personally had very low LDLs. So it's not really been an issue uh, for me. I hope that helped. Again, you let me go down a bunny hole. Mezzanine, can you speak to the recovery? During high intensity interval training, do you recover based on a preset length of time or is it heart rate dependent or a percentage of max? That's a great question. So Mezzanine, the vast majority of people that I'm working with um, don't have quite the technology available to start looking at a specific heart rate. More and more people are starting to use these. Um, Fitbits and other items uh, where they can get some heart rate, but uh, it's still uh, still sometimes a challenge. I can tell you this, professional cyclists, guys who uh, live or who who live or die professionally by their ability to uh, crank up their heart rate, uh, have spent their whole careers with this type of uh, hit training, 30 seconds on, uh, 45 seconds to 90 seconds off. So for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, high intensity interval is a cycle. And you go through, you start with three cycles, work up to 10 or 20, and you don't do it more than three times a week because these are stressful on your body. The whole idea is to stress your cardiovascular system. Um, and again, the goal, you may not be where most people, when, especially if they're not in shape, are not in a place where they can do this. But one of the most practical ways of doing this is uh, finding an area. Uh, I'm since uh, I was doing it on personally on a treadmill in the YMCA. 
uh, when COVID happened, I, I headed outdoors. I now run around my uh, a circle that I live on. And I have 30 second time periods uh, marked off, 30 to 45 seconds. And I get a, I, I sprint. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not, um, I'm not being gentle at all. And I'm pushing that, pushing it for about 30 to 45 seconds. And then I have a slow minute, minute and a half. And I do about 12 of those uh, three times a week. Um, if you're, I have people, I've had people say, oh, well, you know what? I want to do more than that. I, I actually have these five minute intense phases on my interval. A five minute intensity is just not, not that helpful. Here's why. You want to stress your cardiovascular system. If you can maintain the intense level, the intensity phase for five minutes, you're not pushing hard enough. So you need to step back, reconfigure, do a shorter intense phase, and then, uh, but much, much uh, higher uh, intensity. I hope that helps, Mezzanine. Fort Worth, is LDL the firefighter responding to inflammation or the arsonist? That's a great question. And you're not gonna get a lot of agreement yet on that issue. Uh, am I, what is my personal perspective? I will say this again, I go back to my experience managing a lot of people with, uh, FH, uh, like I had said, I'm not worried. I, I personally recommend that you keep it somewhere between, uh, you know, 50 and 150 on the lower end of that. But, um, I will say this, uh, the, the folks that do have FH do not have, quite the level of uh, reserve once they start losing, once, once their, in, um, their inflammation kicks up from uh, prediabetes and diabetes, they tend to move faster in terms of development of plaque. So there is at least some point and some time once the inflammation happens, once that um, uh, glycocalyx, the lining of the artery wall has a, thing called glycocalyx, it's little hairs, glyco meaning uh, made out of sugars, little hairs made out of sugars. And once you're, uh, you start getting damage to those, LDL, no matter what level it is in the blood, is able to uh, transmit through that glycocalyx, through the intima, and gets lodged in the intima media uh, area. That's why CIMT, intima media thickness, can give us a lot more information about how much plaque you have. So back to your question, is it the firefighter or the uh, arsonist? There is a time when it does create some of the problem. I do know that. But what's not so clear is, uh, is that LDL actually being a firefighter at some point as well? And again, I, I think the answer you get to that is going to depend on who you listen to. I'm not, uh, to me, I think either, either group that's really uh, committed is really more committed from emotional perspective than it, they are from the evidence. Shut up, get out. Res residual consequence of past smoking, about 20 pack years, 40 years smoke free. A couple of points. Um, up and out. Um, so yes, thank you for sharing. Uh, 20 pack year history is a significant number. Uh, one thing that most people don't know when they talk about folks like you who have a significant risk, um, they think that all the risk is associated with lung cancer or COPD. There is risk for both of those. However, there's even more risk for heart attack and stroke associated with cardiovascular inflammation uh, from a 20 pack year uh, smoking history. However, the last part you made, 40 years smoke free, for each year after you have stopped smoking, your cardiovascular, your increase in cardiovascular risk 
continues to level back down to where it would have been had you not smoked. So at this point, the heart attack and stroke risk from smoking is not quite so much of an issue for you. Now, as you said, residual, residual, con so that's the biggest residual consequence, the impact on cardiovascular health, but then there's the impact on uh, lungs. And again, as we mentioned before, uh, stopping smoking was the best thing that you could have done for yourself. And each year you get beyond that. It's another year you're giving your, um, your uh, body a chance to heal. Fort Worth, background lighting, much better than last week. Well, thank you, Fort Worth. I appreciate you noticing and I appreciate the feedback. So I won't get into the details. I will just say this. I hate technology. I hate, I hate video technology. I hate expensive cameras. I never owned a camera in my whole life. Well, I did own one camera. It was an old used one that my, uh, that Janice's father had had. It was a hand-me-down. I'd, I'd owned a couple of hand-me-downs uh, just because I hate cameras. I hate studios. You, you make one change in this software and everything. Uh, we, Thank you for your input, though. You know, it's it's like it's like things I've hated in my life. I've also I've always also hated uh, the whole concept of teaching. If there was one thing I was never ever ever going to be in my life, it was a teacher. If there was another thing I was never ever ever going to do in my life, it was. Uh, mess with cameras and video uh, technology. And maybe a third thing, which I hated a whole lot, was PowerPoint. <laughs> so I'm spending all my time doing the three things that I hated most in life. BJJ, during heart or valve surgery, patients often have very elevated blood glucose. My fasting blood glucose went from 92 to 120 to 150. Mm. Bad news. You know what that means, by the way. Top clinics give pre meal insulin shot, uncontrolled blood glucose equals 500% increase in mortality. It's a good point. Thank you so much for sharing that, BJJ. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I, well, I'll, I'll leave that. Uh, alone. I'm not sure that people do know. I'm not uh, my BJJ, my blood glucose has since returned to near normal. Thank you so much for sharing. To clarify, the 500% increased mortality is for the period following valve surgery. I'm not aware of the percent in increase after heart surgery, but imagine it's also very elevated. Well, valve surgery, um, I'm guessing you know, is an incredibly stressful uh, activity for the human body. Jonathan Hull, do you take two grams of niacin all at once every day or one gram in the morning and one gram in the evening? Uh, the answer is yes. You can do either one. Uh, I take a long acting. I used to take rugby. Uh, now I take uh, Endurison and I don't have any financial connection to either one of those groups, but uh, those were the the ones, uh, Endurison actually has been shown, <clears throat> at least in our experience with our patients, uh, to be a little bit more tolerable. You know, a, a, um, we had a commenter recently. I, I don't know. I don't know how I would find his comments now, but he shared that his brother had a problem with, I believe it was hepatitis associated with uh, niacin. I believe, uh, I believe he died as well. So uh, a lot of people talk about niacin as if there's absolutely no problem with it. It's over the counter, right? You can have some challenges with anything, uh, even over the counter stuff that for the most part is safe. So uh, for those of you that take niacin, make sure that you need to. I have some people that take it just because they like the rush of the, uh, you know, they don't take the long acting. They take the regular niacin and they love to have that skin rush. Uh, I wouldn't take it just for that. I would take it for LP little a uh, to help with uh, HDL, to help with LDL. Fort Worth, if LDL is elevated greater than 150, would test for plaque two and myeloperoxidase be recommended? 
I'd recommend those uh, quarterly anyway for most folks, just because you don't know. Um, you, uh, as I've shared before a couple of times. So number one, uh, the most common cause of uh, elevated cardiovascular inflammation is not LDL, not even elevated LDL. It's elevated blood sugars and or elevated um, insulin. I've also shared in the past, uh, there's evidence using uh, blood stu uh, using sleep studies. You can go in and take a sleep study and find that somebody had suboptimal sleep. When they had suboptimal sleep, they ended up having an increase in insulin resistance for the next 48 hours. This was suboptimal sleep that they didn't know that they, they had a problem with their sleep that night. So uh, yes, I recommend screening with myeloperoxidase and um, plaque 2 It's part of our inflammation panel that we get for screening patients. It's part of the panel we recommend. I recommend it quarterly. Uh, some patients, uh, again, appear to be stable and will stretch their, uh, their meetings out to once a year even or once a, uh, twice a year, depending on uh, their ability and desire to see me. It's, I'm a little bit more expensive than your typical doc. But again, to repeat, I find that uh, elevated insulin and elevated glucose are, high, are bigger issues for inflammation than LDL. Richard Gilberti, my circulatory lumen is echocardiogram clear. Uh, do you know what that means, Richard? Because if there's probably what, 300 places in Nashville where you can get a, a vascular ultrasound, only one or two that'll actually measure your plaque. The rest of them will say, oh, you don't have any obstruction of your blood flow. That's the cut point they're looking for. That's sort of like doing a stress test, Richard. A stress test measures blood flow in your heart. Only 50%, you have to have 50% or more occlusion of the flow of the lumen to get an impact on your blood flow. So most places when you get a stress test or when you get one of these uh, routine ultrasounds, um, they're saying, look, uh, we don't see plaque because there's not a 50% uh, occlusion. Two thirds, over 70% of heart attacks occur in people that don't have 50% occlusion. Therefore, their stress test would have been negative and their quote, um, ultrasound of the veins of the arteries would have been negative. So you need to know exactly what you're talking about. Here's the other thing, Richard, you're saying echocardiogram. Uh, that's a, that's a, that's a totally different thing. So I'm, I'm stuck. I don't really understand what you're saying. Anyhow, can water fasting or vitamin K2 fix any intima plaque or calcification? They help. Uh, they, the, the idea is to slow down insulin resistance and both of those things do appear to help with insulin resistance. Fort Worth. Thanks for the chat. Always informative. Thank you, Fort Worth, for your interest. Richard, organic chemistry removed aortic vegetation. That's interesting. Thank you so much, uh, to all of you who've joined today. I know that it's on lung disease. People say, oh, I don't have that problem. That's sort of like saying, oh, plaque or, oh, prediabetes. I don't have that problem. You might want to check. Thanks again.